afternoon. Every child deserves to have at least one person be crazy about them. And I truly understood that after coming and visiting the day and talking to the students and teachers and, and the community here and hearing everyone talk about the leadership, principal, and superintendent, and how they're supported so much to, to be innovative and be creative, that they have that autonomy. And that's so important. I have always believed in my life as a teacher and principal that teachers have always been the most creative and innovative people in the world. They just need everybody else to get out of the way. That we need to let teachers teach, let them support our students and children to become what they can become. And for myself to think about my, my third grade teacher, my, my mother uh, uh, raised eight children, a single mom walked into my third grade classroom. I grew up in, in Philadelphia in the Diamond Street Project near Temple University. And, and my mother walked into my third grade teacher, a young white female who was not from our community, but who was there every day saving private Ryan. Just like the rest of those teachers who were there every day uh, believing in children and helping them. My mother said to my teacher, my older children are not graduating from college. One of my children must graduate from college. And I was the next to the youngest. And my teacher had every reason to say, I can't focus on your son. I have 25 other students to, to work with to focus on. But she didn't do that. That's not what good teachers do. Excellent teachers move ordinary children to do extraordinary things. And she worked with my fourth grade teacher, who was an older African-American female who had been at our school about 30 or 40 years. We thought she came with our building. <laughs> she, had, she had about 10 after-school programs, and not one had a title. They were all called Get In Here. <laughs> and we just got right in because those two teachers knew that if we were going to save lives, that we had to disrupt the norm. That we, that, we, that, we, that we had to, to be innovative and creative, to find ways to, 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 to engage children, to go where they are and take them to where we want them to go. And those two teachers worked with me and my mom and helped me get into a, a middle magnet school for gifted kids. And they knew I was strong. I came from a tough background, tough family, tough community, but they supported me. And they, and they helped me get into high school. And whenever I would come back, they would always help me. And I went to high school and started playing basketball. And I started thinking that I could skip college and go right to the NBA. And my teachers, my elementary teachers, and my high school teachers, and my counselor, they all cornered me one day and said, we need to talk to you, son. And I said, why? They said, well, we heard you talking about skipping college and going to the NBA. I said, yes. Do you know a good agent? They said, no, but we've seen you play basketball. <laughs> they said, son, you can't jump over a credit card. <laughs> you are not going to the NBA, but you're smart enough to get an MBA. Why don't you go away to college and come back and help the same community, support the same community that supported you, just like this community? Well, you've rallied around the school and around children to host a huge event which will be heard around the world. Teachers around the world, I'm talking to you. You are saving lives every day, and we support you. This is Teacher Appreciation Week. It's the greatest week that we can ever have. It's also the same week we have to appreciate nurses, so my nurse is not happy right now because she has to share the limelight with teachers, but it's fine. But those teachers knew that I needed more. And so my teacher said, you need to go away to college. And they talked me into spending four years on the campus of East Stroudsburg University. The best four years of my life. But I graduated from East Stroudsburg with a bachelor's in communication, and I came back home to my neighborhood in Philadelphia, and I didn't have a job. And I went to those same teachers, and I said, listen, you told me to go away to college. Not only do I not have a J-O-B, I don't have a C-A-R or APT. They said, well, we didn't promise you you'd be rich. I said, yes, but my friends back in the neighborhood told me I was wasting my time going to college. They said, you'd be better off in the state Penn instead of Penn State. Why choose Yale over Yale? But those teachers who always knew that we've got to find a way to keep students thinking, engage them before the information. They said, no, you must understand that your experience in Stroudsburg will allow you to come back and say to a young person that you can be me because I was once you. That you've been exposed to diversity. That you've met people from around the world and you go back to your community and change your community. And my high school English teacher said, listen, 
You were a communications major, and I have a brother who's an executive producer for a cable sports channel. I can get you a part-time job. It won't be a full-time job, but at least you can tell your friends that you have a job. But see, my friends back at home, they were not going to be impressed with a part-time cable job. Most of them, most of my friends who were teasing me and giving me problems, they didn't graduate high school, but they would not be impressed with a part-time job. So when I went back to the neighborhood, I told my friends that I was working on Nightline with Ted Collins. They didn't know anything about the nightly news. Most of my friends, it took them two hours and about 60 minutes. So they didn't know anything about Ted Collins. But I learned then early, I learned then early in my career that there's so many young people who deal with this fear of alienation, who deal with this feeling of wanting and needing to impress their peers. But the teachers, the adults, the parents, the community, you are always there supporting those students and helping them overcome those obstacles and those odds. And those te my teachers said to me, don't worry about impressing them. They were impressed when you left the neighborhood and you decided to go away to college. When you decided to be different, when you decided to do something different with your life, you were already impressed the people in your community. But I had this wonderful job working in part-time in cable television. I worked for what we called the NBA beat for an armor sports channel. And every week we'd spend the day with an NBA player, most of the time. So we spend the day with Michael Jordan or Larry Bird. A day with Charles Barkley was very interesting. And Shaquille O'Neal as well. But one thing I learned is talking to these NBA millionaires, they would often talk about their former teachers, their coaches, their parents. They'd always talk about how children in schools miss the message of why it's important to get an education. Yeah, we're athletes, but we're student athletes. And that message does not get back to our young people. They hear about the money and the cars, but they don't understand that Michael Jordan left college early, but he went back to finish. That there's so many athletes who get educated and do, who do a great job. But my high school teacher said, listen, why don't you come in and speak to our students one day about your job in television? And see, teachers always have an ulterior motive. They weren't going to fool me. So I was ready. So when I walked into the school to talk about my job, I was prepared to answer a few questions and get back to moving on with my career. But most of the young people, when I visited the school on career day, they didn't even ask me my name. They wanted to know how much money did Larry Bird have and how many cars did Michael Jordan own. But there were a few students who came to me after the program. And they came to me and they said, you know, Mr. L, if you can come in and motivate us, how come you aren't a teacher? It was the first time in my life that someone had asked me a question and I had no response. Not my professors at ESU, not my mother, not my coaches, some young people. They taught me how to become the same person that I complained about. The community nurtured me, the school raised, supported me, and I made it out and came back and did nothing. So I walked into my job and I quit. And I enrolled in graduate school and I got a certificate to teach a math degree. And a couple years later, I went back to the same high school and started teaching. And the same students were there were a little older. And they all ran up to me and I thought they would run up to me and hug me and say, welcome back, Mr. L, or welcome back, Kyle, or something. They said, you know, Mr. L, you were fool to leave that TV job. <laughs> we were not serious. We were hoping that you would help us get a job when we graduated. But if you've ever worked in a school, if you've ever mentored a young person, you know it takes one day for young people to realize that you have found your call. That this work, this work is truly a ministry. That these children will keep us on our toes and on our knees every day. But it is truly a blessing to be able to bless others. And so I knew that I had found my calling, but I also realized that high school reform does not begin in high school. That 50% or more of the students who drop out of high school drop out in the ninth grade or before. I said I have to find a way to reach students before they decide to make those decisions in high school. We have seven million minutes from pre-K to high school graduation to try to reach our students. And I said to myself, I'm going to start working with younger children. So I spent the next 10 years of my life working in our feet of middle school. And if you've ever worked in the middle school, you know, you either love it or you know. To those children, one day are children, and one day they're adults. But it's also where children can be shaped, can be molded, where teachers are, have to be creative, have to be innovative, have to be transformational, because the children are going through so many changes. 
But what I encountered when I walked into Box Middle School at 24 and Master Street, Gate Temple University in Philadelphia, is I walked into a neighborhood where in 10 years we lost almost 20 students to murder. There's no teacher certification program that will ever prepare you to walk into a school and see an empty chair that an 11, 12 year old child will never sit in again. Nothing. And I said to myself that I must find a way to teach these students to choose the behavior that they can choose the behavior, but they cannot choose the consequences. So I started teaching them to play chess. I started teaching special education students mathematics on a chessboard. Knights move on right angles, bishops move on diagonals. The chessboard is a large square that contains 64 smaller squares. I thought I was teaching these students mathematics on a chessboard, but what I was really giving them was intellectual capital because they were now walking around the school carrying chess boards. And if you don't think anything else about a student who plays chess, that you believe that they are smart. What I learned as a teacher is smart is not something you are, it is something that you can become. These students are walking around carrying chess boards and other students say, you play chess? Aren't you in the learning disabled program? Yes I am, but let's play a match and see if you should be my roommate. <laughs> it humbles you. So these children started beating me right away, started beating the other students and other teachers, and then all of the students wanted to play. <coughs> and so the teacher said, why don't you take them out to play against other schools? And they started playing against other elementary and middle schools and started winning right away. That's not a good recipe for children. They became very arrogant. They weren't humble at all. You probably don't know any young people like that. <laughs> but I said to myself, I got to find a way to humble them. So we said, you will now begin to play high school. And then they started beating high schools. And then we decided to take them to the U.S. Amateur Chess Championship, largest team versus team event in the world, larger than the Olympics. But we wanted to find a way to humble our students. Their first match, these were elementary and middle school students, their first match that we matched up against Bucknell University's chess team. And I told the students, remember, this is for you to be humble. Learn from losing. Failure is motivated. Success can be paralyzed. And after the match, I was proud of my students because they weren't upset, they were proud of their effort, but they said, yeah, there's one issue, Mr. L, we beat that team. <laughs> I said, wait a minute, what do you mean you beat that team? And I found there was one player who came back, a graduate student to play with his friend. Remember, there was no age limit. And I said, what happened? He said, I have two questions for you, sir. Are these middle school students or midget adults? <laughs> he said, we've never played against children who think like that. He said, who is the chess master that works with them? I said, we come from a poor district. We can't afford a chess master. These children are surrounded by teachers who teach them every day that success only comes before work and addiction. That they must work hard. That they must, if they're going to achieve their dreams, they must work harder than everyone else. And the students went on later in that tournament. This was in 1997. Later in that tournament to defeat a team of four men whose combined age was over 200 years, never done before in the tournament. And one of our students defeated an expert level player, never done in 35 years in this tournament. The tournament director said, I'd like to treat your children to dinner in our hotel restaurant. The tournament was at Hilton Hotel in Park City, New Jersey. I said, sir, this is the Hilton Hotel. You don't want to let my children in your restaurant. <laughs> you give me a few dollars, I'll take them to McDonald's and they'll be happy. He said, no, this has never been done before. So I took the children outside the restaurant. I said, read the menu. When we go in, if you can't pronounce it, don't order. <laughs> they went in order for let me know, crab this day. But that was their experience as some children who live like that every day. There's a large achievement gap. There's also a major exposure. So for these children, it's no surprise that most of those children who were there in 1997 at that tournament went on to receive scholarships full four-year scholarships to come. Later on in 1997, in April, in Knoxville, Tennessee, our students won the eighth national chess championship. Our school has won eight titles, seven consecutive titles, never done before in America. Children who are surrounded and supported by teachers who are innovative and critical, who are teaching them to think outside the box. Then all the Schwarzenegger heard about our students and came to visit our school. He wanted to run for president, run for governor, and he wanted to start after school programs. And he came and he started bragging about chess. And I said, Arnold, you came to the wrong school bragging about chess. He said, I make everybody on the movie set play chess. It keeps them alert. I played when I was young. I said, yes, but not here, Arnold. You want to talk about terminating people? That's great. 
<laughs> you're going to talk about being expendable, that's fine. But don't talk about chess. Then he made a bigger mistake. He challenged one of my young ladies. He said, I want to play her. No, don't play the girls. They treat the chess pieces like offspring. They play hours and never trade a piece. <laughs> he wanted to play little Denise, top 50 female chess player in the nation. She said, Mr. L, I was afraid. He's rich. He's famous. He's married to a woman who has more money than him, so I know he's upset. <laughs> she said, but I checkmated him just like he was another guy. And then Arnold donated $20,000 to our program. We've never received a dime from our students. We only are supported. We're supported by corporations and churches and individuals. But with that 20000 we were able to purchase luggage for our students. Blazers with the school name embroidered. These are the kinds of things that, that our children can do when people like you and the community supports them. In my first year as principal, I received a phone call from one of my former students, one of my first chess players, a young man named Otis Bullock. And it was a tough year for me as principal because I truly thought that being a principal would be just like breaking up fights in the lunchroom, but it wasn't. I was breaking up more fights between my teachers than I ever did in the lunchroom. But he said, I'm calling you because I'm graduating from Westchester University this weekend. I know you haven't heard from me, but I don't want to graduate without calling and thanking you and to ask one thing. Can you find all of my former teachers and let them know that one of their kids is there? And I said, wait a minute, Otis, you don't understand. I've been to too many funerals. I need to go to more graduations. Are you really graduated from Russia? He said, oh yeah, I'm done this weekend. I'm not asking you to come, but let my teachers know that I made it. And I called those teachers, and we were all there. We cried through the entire ceremony. We couldn't believe that one of our kids made it. That was in June of 2000. In May, two, May 2004, that young man, Otis Bullock, graduated from Temple Law School. It was the proudest moment of our life to see one of our children, one of our students, who, who believed in the immortality of influence who believes in what we were giving them every day. That's the importance of what we do as teachers, as parents, as mentors, as role models. Leadership is about service. If you don't serve, you can't lead. I learned early on is the duty of the administration to serve the people, not the people the administration. So during this great week, Teacher Appreciation Week, I want to thank all the teachers around the world, all of those who serve and who support our children and help you to, to, to be recognized for what you do. And all of those parents out there, because every teacher is not a parent, but every parent is a teacher. And so I ask all those teachers out there, and everyone in the audience, and everyone in the world, to join me and my staff members back at my school in Wilmington, Delaware, as we stop praying for a light load and start praying for a stronger back. Thank you very much.